Hello there, hello everybody, whoever's watching tonight or today or whatever time you're um, maybe getting this in the archives. Carlton Pearson, and thanks for tuning in to Streaming Consciousness, which is a part of expanding your consciousness to think broader, more brilliantly, more cur- curiously, and more intriguingly outside the box. <clears throat> Aren't you tired of business as usual? Aren't you tired of the sort of stuffy ways we've been doing things Well, I tap on your mind. This is my friend Charles Holt singing. Tapping, tugging, pulling, querying, questioning, trying to get you to rethink some things, trying to get as many people as possible to. Had a wonderful conversation today with some brothers from Prague in Czechoslovakia where D.E. Park and and, um, David Alden and I are going to possibly go this spring uh, to a sort of a... A New Thought Conference. They're not calling it New Thought because it's a 97% atheist country. But they would like for us to come in and share to about with about 15,000 people who will go through that that uh, conference uh, this summer. I'm, a, I'm thrilled to be there. And, um, and I'm glad to talk to agnostics or atheists or people who don't, who aren't jaded by presupposed notions about anything. Certainly not about God. In fact, some of the most interesting conversations I've ever had about God have been with people who are atheists, who say they don't believe in God. Of course, when somebody tells me they don't believe in God, I always say, which one? Because there's so many of them out there. And they may say, none of them. Well, tell me what you do believe. And then I listen to them. And I find out that uh, a lot of what we believe parallels a lot. They're not jaded and stuck and stagnated in their consciousness by a lot of the things we've been taught. So it's a very good feeling. Uh, I want to talk, before I get into tonight's, um, and we have a lot to talk about tonight, I'm continuing with what we did last week, but I want to talk about our Fall Summit 2013 here in Chicago, Monday, October 14th through Wednesday the 16th at the Congress Plaza Hotel, almost within walking distance of us, uh, 520 South Michigan Avenue, right here in Chicago, Illinois. The purpose of the gathering is to assemble what I call cultural and spiritual progressives interested in finding new ways to address and or navigate the new paradigm or the new pattern or the new model, this new spiritual and cultural template, um, and then adjusting to this quote-unquote new normal, relating faith to culture in practical, spiritual, and responsible ways, and to discuss the global shift in religious sensibilities, theology, uh, economy, politics, science, and I, there's so many people, there are literally thousands of people who are rethinking things, and I want to assemble a sort of a conclave, I'm calling it a leadership summit, and um, we're going to talk about what is the new normal, what does that mean, will it last, or is it just a, a passing phase, how should the church respond to it, what is what I call metacostalism, the bridging of, of Pentecostalism and metaphysics. And, of course, that I don't want to exclude anybody because there's many people that have embraced, of course, our brand of, of expanded consciousness who aren't Pentecostal. But uh, I'm talking about the transcendent part, the mystical aspect of Pentecostalism, not the dogma. Um, anyway, there are increasing numbers of ministers and pastors and lay leaders and business community leaders um, with, 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 who, are, who are interested and in, in they're looking and leaning toward expanded consciousness. So I'm inviting you to come to Chicago and spend these three days. It's totally formal. You can wear jogging outfits. You can wear jeans every day, caps, no caps, sweaters, pullovers, whatever. Uh, no, no suits and ties, no vestments and collars and all that. You can if you want to, but that's not expected and it's certainly not required. Um, anyway, the summit will be three days and two nights of interacting, interfacing, considering strategies and technologies and embracing uh, various um, uh, transition and transformation that can happen in our lives and to us and through us and, uh, and, and embracing this new age of enlightenment and how we fit into it. The registration fee is $100, $150, and it includes summit meals. That'll be like two continental breakfasts and two lunches. You're on your own at night for dinner. Sometimes we'll go together someplace to eat. Or we might have uh, something ordered into the last minute. But anyway, we, we're going to be right there at that hotel. So a, de- a $50 d- uh, deposit is due by August 31st, the end of this month. And then the balance due by September 15th. So we can have all of our ducks in a row. All registrations received after September 15th must be paid in full. Now we're talking $150. Uh, you need to, go, need to go online right now. I, I've asked you to save the date some months ago. Attire, as I said, is totally comfortable. Blocks of rooms available at the 
uh, the Congress Hotel uh, with the contact info. It's just a link will be up this weekend on the site, this site. And uh, <clears throat> the brochure will be there for questions, or you can email me at CDP. That's for Carlton Demetrius Pearson. CDP at bishoppearson.com. CDP at bishoppearson.com. That address is on the site. And you'll receive your registration registration packet. For more information, you may call 312-546-3045. 312-546-3045. If the line is busy or no, no, just get a voicemail, we'll call you back. Okay? So <clears throat> be a part of that. And then, of course, we're planning to go to Israel uh, a year ago, a year from this October, uh, I, the first only that I've ever heard of and that my people in Israel tell me, the first only radically inclusive peace tour where we'll visit, of course, all the holy holy spots of the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim religions, as well as go up into Haifa, just north of Israel, to the beautiful, magnificent headquarters and temple of the Baha'i faith. We'll have panel discussions and music, and we'll, we'll ride on the Sea of Galilee, and if you want to be baptized in the Jordan just for nostalgic reasons, we'll do that as well. But it's going to be a great, great time. And any of you who may want to come to pray, pray uh, Czechoslovakia. If you can't make the Israel trip, you just want to you can make your own arrangements. We'll give you more information about that later. But I will be there for a week along with Pastor D.E. Polk of Atlanta, Georgia, and David Hall, uh, um, David uh, Alt of the um, Spiritual, the Center for Spiritual Living. He's actually in, I think, Germany now or Paris or something. Anyway, so many things. Prague, a well-known, uh, I understand, um, an actor and a businessman and a pastor there have come together and and uh, there's just new, there's new interest in not in religion, but in spirituality. And that's what I want to talk to you more about tonight. I put a post out today and got a, quite a bit of a response from title, Can You Believe in, Follow, and or Walk with Jesus Without Worshiping Him? Can you believe in, follow, walk with Jesus, and not necessarily worship it? Worship him, something that he never expected or invited or encouraged. But we do it. I've done it. We have great songs that I still feel deeply touched when I sing about worshiping God or worshiping Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the all the things I've brought up with. I can still, even though I don't believe dogmatically the way I once did, I still can sing songs whose lyrics probably should be changed. But if there's another something beyond the lyrics. There's a, there's a certain mode and a certain mood and a model in my spirit that I feel when I worship the way I've been taught in, uh, as a Christian and in Pentecostalism, but I'm not stuck there. Anyway, let me, let me quote from something from this, uh, this incredible new book by Oslin Reza. You've probably heard about it. Uh, it's a best-selling book. It's called Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm not through reading it. I just got it on my Kindle. But I've seen some talk shows about it, and there's quite a buzz about it. But here's something he wrote. Today, this is a scholar, a degreed scholar, earned degrees. Uh, Today, I can confidently say that two decades of rigorous academic research into the origins of Christianity has made me a more genuinely committed disciple of Jesus of Nazareth than I ever was of Jesus Christ. Whoa. As soon as I read that, I stopped. Brilliant. Let me read it again. This is from a scholar from an academician uh, and a former Christian preacher. A Muslim converted to Christianity, preached the gospel, gave his heart to Christ, received Christ, was born again, preached passionately all over the world, as I have. And then he read it, and in, in, in his studying, he re, rethought some things. Today, he says, and I'm quoting him, I can confidently say that two decades of rigorous academic research into the origins of Christianity has made me a more genuinely committed disciple of Jesus of Nazareth than I ever was of Jesus Christ. My hope with this book, he says, is to spread the good news of the Jesus of history with the same fervor that I once applied to spreading the story of the Christ, Aslan Reza. Now, you might say, what's a Muslim been uh, doing talking about Jesus in the first place? He literally converted to Christ. You've got to read the book. I'm not going to tell you all about it, Um, but it's, it's fascinating. You can get it on Amazon.com. It's like, toss, like maybe $12 or something like that. Now, Jesus once asked his disciples, and this is part of the post, who do people say the Son of Man, notice he didn't say Son of God, 
He said, Son of Man. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Son of Man is the translation of various Hebrew and Greek phrases used in both Hebrew uh, and New Testament Bibles. <clears throat> when I say the Hebrew, I mean basically the Old Testament. <clears throat> it has diverse meanings, ranging from a normal human being to a prophesied eternal divine ruler like King David. Son of Man is usually a, a reference to uh, some connection to David when Jesus used it, because he is biologically in his family line, bloodline, connected to King David. The Hebrew, Hebrew ex, uh, expression of Son of Man is Ben Adam, uh, ben Adam or Ben Adam appears 170 times in the in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. 93 of them are in the Book of Ezekiel. 14 are found elsewhere. The term Son of Man, Ben Adam, Ben in Hebrew is son. In Christian usage, New Testament, unlike uh, the Son of God title, the uh, which has been essentially an element of the Christian article of faith or proclamation of faith and creed since the apostolic age, the proclamation of Jesus as the Son of Man has never been an article of faith in Christianity. He's always referred to as the Son of God. He referred to himself almost constantly and entirely as the Son of Man. The interpretation of the use Son of Man in the New Testament has remained a challenging uh, or challenge uh, after 150 years of debate and discourse. No consensus on the issue has emerged among scholars. So the Son of Man thing is just sort of left out here. You don't hear a lot of commentary on it. Jesus is called the Son of God. And yet, this was Jesus' favorite reference to himself. Who do people say the Son of Man? The Son of Man will come in all of his glory. He's talking about an earthly existence and an earthly expression. Not so much his divine self, which he knew he was divine and insinuated that, and that we too are divine, that he is not necessarily any more divine than we are. He was just more illumined, more evolved, more enlightened about his divinity and pointed people to theirs. He didn't point people to follow him, to worship him. He said, follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men that you'll gain other people to wake up to who they are in consciousness and in spirit. Son of Man is a common Jewish reference to the king of David's kingly succession uh, or in reference to commanding reformers or nonconformists of his day. The Son of Man, that's the way Jesus saw himself. And he's mentioned, he mentions himself that way constantly, never Son of God. The, in fact, the first time Jesus is called Son of God, is in the wilderness temptation. And it was the Diabolos. I think I've said it to you once before. It was the devil. If you be, there's a doubt there, the son of God, command these stones. On the cross at Calvary, one of the malefactors said, uh, he says he's the son of God, but he never really said that. This was the assumption. People wanted him to be a son of God because Mythology suggests there are sons of God. First, there's the son of God, S-U-N, in English consciousness. But we are always been sun worshippers and stargazers since way before the Egyptian civilization, the Sumerians and the Akkadians who preceded the, uh, the, uh, the Egyptian civilizations. You can study history, as this gentleman has done, and you will find that sons of God, messianic or God-men type personalities have existed for millennia, thousands of years before Jesus did. In fact, if you really study Christian Christianity in its totality, you will find that we borrowed a lot of myths from other pagan and or non-Jewish or non-Christian organizations or, or, or concepts or ad, uh, forms of worship, models for worship. Uh, and I have a whole series of that on, online. You can go to the archives and read, uh, hear me talk more about that because I don't want to spend as much time on that today. When I first moved to Chicago, by the way... Um, it was about four years ago, I visited Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam. And uh, I went there to actually apologize for some unkind things I had said about him publicly. And since I've entered this inclusion consciousness, I believe everybody has, has something to say, whether I agree with it or not. But I respect the man. And I, while I ended up being in his house for three and a half hours right here, and we talked, one of the questions I asked him was, what do you think about Jesus? And the first thing he said to me, which really stunned me, slightly offended me, but not really. He said, well, many of you preaching and teaching about Jesus don't even know him. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I said, uh, actually, was act I, I was fascinated by his boldness, by his sincerity, and by his authority. 
He's a senior statesman and a brilliant thinker. I said, tell me what you think about Jesus. I used to sing a song when I was a kid in the church. Tell me what you think about Jesus. He's all right. Tell me what do you think about Jesus. He's all right. The crowd would say that. So I asked the minister, Ferguson, what you think about Jesus? And he, he sat down. We sat down and he gave me the most extraordinary discussion, teaching, if you will, or exhortation on Jesus that I've ever heard before or since. I was totally fascinated. This man, of course, has studied Christ as so many, many others have in history. People really love Jesus. Now, many folk who love him don't worship him. And uh, uh, sometimes Christians, non-Christians, understand and appreciate Jesus in ways Christians don't and haven't. And maybe won't because they don't, they're not interested. Mahatma Gandhi said, I may have become Christian were it not for Christians. <laughs> What gospel, let me get back to the post, what gospel did Jesus preach? Was it the so-called gospel of Jesus Christ? Is that what Jesus preached? <laughs> Most Christians, including the Apostle Paul, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, but not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. They preached the gospel of Jesus, or Jesus Christ, but not the gospel that Jesus preached. The good news. Gospel means good news. Did Jesus preach Jesus or did he preach something else? Later on I'm going to quote from his most famous sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't mention himself once. <laughs> I love Jesus. I follow his teachings and his example but I don't worship him. I stopped a long time and I am not offended by people who do. I can go on a worship service and his name is going to be mentioned tens of thousands of times. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Just praise Jesus. I understand all that and I'm not offended by it. I think it's harmless. But I think it conceptually hinders your forward thrust into the Christ consciousness. Because you stop at Jesus, who was a man, and refer to himself as that, son of man. Is it possible, Aristotle said, uh, excuse me, Aristotle said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I can entertain the thought of Jesus, even of worship Jesus, songs about Jesus and about the blood, and about it, because I've sang them with the best in rest and with passion and with tears and sometimes with fears. But I understand Jesus differently. I think I understand him better. I understand God better. I think it's more important what Jesus said about God than what the church says about Jesus, if you want to know the truth. Christ's consciousness is a lot more than a man or a mantra. It is even more than the man Jesus, Christ consciousness is. So let's go to the next level of self and soul expansion and expression in spirit. So as we continue a little bit of last week's le Lester, uh, lecture, which I'm constantly trying to get people free from religious tyranny, from um, unreasonable dogma, from fear-based theologies, and to get um, uh, inwardly whole and inwardly holy, Religion these days, particularly in the Western world, Western thought, means God-fearing. When you say he's a religious person, whether you're talking about a Jew, a Muslim, or a Christian, you're tending to say this guy is, fears God and, and follows some kind of model or manual to appease the God that he fears, who is angry. Okay, So that you can assume that he's going to be fairly moral because he doesn't want to tick God off. And so sometimes the illusion or assumption is that he's a trustworthy person. The Greek word desidemonia, God-fearing, you know, is, is, it, it actually translates superstition in the King James Version. Superstition. Diedo means to fear. Diamon, demon in English, is a pagan deity. So superstition is, is the, the, uh, probably the widest form of religion expressed on the planet in all the faiths. Fear of the gods, desidemonia, superstition. The Latin word for pagan is paganos, which basically means villager or rustic from pagos, which means country or countrymen. These are people who lived in the rural areas. They were generally uneducated. They were land lovers. They were root workers. They were ecologists. They were tree and plant lovers. They were herbalists and sometimes suspicious because they would mix herbals 
herbs into drugs and potions and get kind of spaced out like mushrooms and peyote, things like that. And they would hug a tree and they would use herbs for healing and they would make healing potions. And later on that became expressed as some form of black magic or voodoo, Creole for voodoo, deity, spirit in African spiritism. Um, Latin paganus also meant civilian. Becoming a Christian uh, and or a Jew, anybody who wasn't a Christian or a Jew or outside of those those uh, predominant religions were considered pagans outside in the country away from the stream of our religious customs, okay? So we have to be careful how we use the term because pagans get offended when you use that. Many of the land lovers and certain aspects of Wicca witchcraft or Wicca witches, I've met Wiccan witches and had engaging conversations with them, and they're harmless. And, you know, this whole fear of demons and things. Uh, and if you believe in that, of course, you can live that fear out and walk it out. If you diminish your respect for uh, goblins and spirits and things that go bump in the night, you won't be as terrorized by it. Now, I'm aware of demons, people who believe in that. I believed in them for years, cast them out with them frothing and cursing and deep voices and very dramatic and all that kind of stuff. I'm not intimidated by it. Wherever I go in the world, that whatever energy or intelligence uh, would intimidate me knows that I am familiar with its accesses and excesses and uh, I'm not afraid of that kind of thing. But if you believe in it, as I did for so year, many years, you have to cast them out every once in a while because you invent them and invite them and invoke them into consciousness and into your life. They become your reality. I can talk a whole teaching just on that. Let me quote something from Mark Twain that I used last week and then I'm going to get on further with the Sermon on the Mount and what gospel Jesus preached. Man is a religious animal. He's the only religious animal, Mark Twain says. He's the only animal that has the true religion. <laughs> Several of them. He is the only animal that loves his neighbor as himself and then cuts his throat if his theology isn't straight. He has made a graveyard of the globe in trying his honest best to smooth his honest best to smooth his brother's path to happiness in heaven. Of course, he's being a bit sarcastic and facetious, but I get his point. I get it very, very thoroughly. In the Sermon on the Mount, which is about the fulfillment of the law, this is the most famous sermon Jesus preached. And the only reason he heralded or shouted it because, and I've been on the Mount of Beatitudes in Israel several times, there's a deep valley leading down to the, the uh, Sea of Galilee, breathtaking views. And uh, he would have had to project his voice because there had no, they had no sound systems, no PE, public address systems in those days. So preachers or helders exerted their voice and real loud and <clears throat> so that people could hear. You don't need to do that in church today, especially with a sound system. Nobody needs to yell. We tend to do it because we're kind of emotional people. But Jesus in the synagogue would read the script, read the uh, scriptures or the, the uh, uh, Talmud or the Torah and sit and teach and talk. All this huffing and puffing and preaching and tuning up that we do, particularly in the African-American Pentecostal circles, it's fun. I love it. I'm a connoisseur of that kind of stuff. But I don't do it anymore. I did it with the best and rest. I understand its nuances. I understand its rhetoric. I understand its emotionalism. I understand its showmanship. And we've got some really prince of preachers out there. That's not the way Jesus preached. And actually preaching is inappropriate in the church. It's for teaching. Preaching is for the streets, but of course, it's illegal to do it in some places. And then if you have a sound system, you don't. it's just to amplify the voice. People don't realize that. When you go preach, I've got to hear the preacher. Well, you're not supposed to hear a preacher. <laughs> you're supposed to hear a teacher. But you can. It's okay. I'm not denouncing it. I'm just making that point. Jesus is quoted to have said in Matthew chapter 5, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now remember, he's talking to Jews. There were Pharisees present. They were following every word he spoke. They were always in his face about something. And he knew they were out there. And they were accusing him of trying to, to abolish the law or the cult, culture and the customs of the Jewish religion. Some of it he was addressing in a, I think, very critical and, and uh, instructive way. Not destructive, but instructive way. Anyway, he made that comment, I think, for them to hear it. Um, these Pharisees and, and members of the Sanhedrin were threatened by Jesus' teaching. And uh, by the huge followings that he, he received, mostly poor peasants, uneducated pe people, illiterates, including many of his disciples. They were not literate people, well-read people, and there were no books, 
mass produced in those days. Everything was handwritten, manuscripts. And um, so the average common person didn't own a book, never even saw one. There were no big libraries in those days. You have to think of all this. Even when you think about the Bible, they weren't reading the Bible. They were quoting scriptures that mostly were kept in the temple or in the synagogues. The rabbi would have access to the scrolls uh, of, the, of the Bible. It was not in, in people's porch um, coffee tables and in their houses. And I've got all kinds of translations here and other supplementary uh, books. I love libraries. I love literature. I love uh, reading and, uh, and studying. But they didn't get to do that in that day. So Jesus was making these comments. He says, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill, meaning or to accomplish or complete, not compete, as they thought he was, but to complete or complement, to, which means basically to apply praise and respect to the culture and the customs of those Jews who believed in the scriptures. Now, mind you, though Jerusalem and Judea, Israel, was an occupied country and Jerusalem an occupied city by the Romans, the Roman Empire there have been seven world empires, Egypt Assyria, Babylon uh, uh, Greece, Rome, and some people believe people Rome, did I miss one? Anyway, seven world empires from Egypt to now the Roman Empire followed by the Holy Roman Church or the Catholic Church, that would be the 6th or 7th and some people believe the United States is the, is the uh, world empire We have, don't forget the British Empire, a part of which America is Anyway, that's a whole lesson on history, another lesson on history. But Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fill them full. I have to honor all the customs because I'm a Jewish uh, young man. My parents were Jewish. I was raised in the culture. I went to Jewish schools and I studied the, the scriptures and the culture. He says, verse 18, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Well, most folks think the law is the whole King James Version, the whole New Testament, the whole holy, inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God. It isn't. He was talking to Jews about a Jewish document and writings, sacred writings, and sometimes secret writings that very few understood. And he was talking to the culture of people who would understand what he was talking about. This is not a comment about the whole Bible. There was no New Testament at the time. You understand that? So he says, um, uh, for truth I tell you, not even until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Now, once here's what he's referring to metaphorically, metaphysically. Once religious people or humankind at large, the world over, finally accedes to higher consciousness, where laws are no longer needed, they will remain. There is a place beyond religious legalism, writings, sacred writings, scripts, scriptures, holy books, holy temples, all that stuff. There is a space and place and consciousness beyond all of that. But until that passes, until the the uh, the man, man's dependency on laws and legal systems and dogma and doctrines and disciplines and religious rites and rituals and rules, until that, as long as that's here and we until we pass beyond it, it's going to always dominate the culture. That's what he basically was, was referring to. Uh, you're never going to feel secure without guides and guards and controlling humankind until you raise your consciousness beyond that. You can transcend religion. You can transcend rituals and rites and, and liturgies, if you will. And that's what's coming, whether you like it or not. The world is shifting. There's this global shift of consciousness. I was referring to you earlier about Prague. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, 97% atheist, and yet it's known the city of temples. I can't wait to see all these beautiful temples. Dee's already been over there. There's all these thousands of gorgeous, ancient, religious temples, mostly Catholic temples and churches, Orthodox churches, that there are more pigeons in than people. Nobody goes anymore. Nobody talks publicly about God or religion over there. But we're going because they're more interested in what they what we're calling new thought or expanded consciousness or some aspects of Pentecostalism. I'll be there for a week to talk about spiritual things, about self-actualization, self-realization, about creating in consciousness. You know one of the more popular books over there is The Secret, The Laws of Attraction. 
They heard that I had known that I know Michael Beckwith and I had been on television with Deepak Chopra. They're fascinated about all that kind of thing. And so I'm going to go and spend some time there. And uh, there'll be 15,000 people coming through. This is a hunger in an atheist country. We may even do some television and radio. Um, let me read the 19th verse. Therefore, anyone, Jesus said, because i got to get to this. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly, now with the Jewish mindset, worldview and religion, that's what he's talking about, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, there, not everybody had the same uh, or held the same concept of heaven or the kingdom of heaven as Jews did. The Jews would have understood possibly what he was talking about. There was not a lot of references to the kingdom of heaven in Jewish thought. They thought the, 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 the kingdom of Israel, Solomon's temple, David, the king of Israel, they thought of earthly kingdoms and earthly thrones. Later on, this same Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he says, the kingdom of God is within you. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's not a matter of what you eat or drink. It's not a matter of right or rituals. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven or God is righteousness, peace, and joy spiritually. Joy in the Holy Ghost or in the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's just so much we could say about that, but just let me finish. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, is he talking about Pharisees because the, and scribes? They are the ones who practice and supposedly taught the commands. I mean, their whole lives revolved around the commandments. They were pious and pompous. You think Jesus is referring to the Pharisees or to the little simple poor peasants? What was he talking about here? Was he being facetious? A lot of times in Jesus' teaching, he's being a little bit sarcastic, a little bit facetious, facetious. not to for the simple people or the commoners. Even his disciples didn't get a lot of what he was talking about. He did speak in mysteries, in higher consciousness. He was a metaphish, metaphysician. In Aslan Risa's book, um, The Zealot, I'm going to quote out of it again. The life and times of Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, in that's the name of the book he wrote. In the end, there are only two hard historical facts about Jesus of Nazareth. He didn't say Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth. They had to say Jesus of Nazareth because there were Jesuses or Yeshuas in Hebrew, Joshuas, all over Israel. It's a very common name. So when you say Jesus or Yeshu, Yeshua, Yehoshua, you have to identify him in the town of Nazareth where he was known to have come from. He was born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth. So that is the Jesus the Nazarene or the Nazarite from Nazareth. So he says here, uh, in the end, there are only two hard historical facts about Jesus of Nazareth upon uh, which we can confidently rely. The first is that Jesus was a Jew who led a popular Jewish movement in Palestine, Palestine at the beginning of the first century in the Christian era. C.E. would mean the Christian era. The second is that Rome crucified him for doing so. He, he, he was a populist Jew. He, he, was, he was a Jew who led a popular Jewish movement. He had his followers. Thousands, sometimes as many as 5,000 men, not, in count, not counting the women and children. Uh, the scripture says that. The Romans, not the Jews, the Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Latins, the Romans, the Roman government crucified. Cruz, F, Cruz is the Latin word for cross. Not the Jewish word, it's the Latin word. Remember one time Jesus said to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. Now, what could that have meant to them? And I'll do a whole teaching on this later. The cross before the cross. He wasn't talking about the tall, tall, tall cross. He was talking about more of an X looking cross. And the people he was talking to were not thinking about Calvary. They weren't thinking about Golgotha. They were not thinking about crucifixion. They didn't even know Jesus would be crucified. He was a Roman citizen. He was a, uh, uh, I suppose, a Roman citizen. I know Paul was. But he lived in Jerusalem, and he was a Jew, and you didn't kill Jews on, on crosses. That was for foreigners and, uh, or, or, or people who were involved in acts of treason. They were traitors. Okay, So when he said, take up your cross and follow me, cross was a sign of enlightenment, a sign of illumination, a sign of surrender to a higher purpose or cause. That's what they would have. It wasn't about death, but many people think it was. Jesus was crucified, asphyxiation on a cross. That's what that means. 
He was crucified. By themselves, these two facts, according to the book, cannot provide a complete portrait of the life of a man who lived 2,000 years ago. That he, was, that he led a Jewish movement, a radical maverick-type movement, and that he was crucified by the Romans for doing so. But when combined with all we know about the tumultuous era in which Jesus lived, and thanks to the Romans, we know a great deal because they wrote things down, which a lot of the... Uh, uh, a lot of what you find about Jesus is, is, is going to be found no place but in the scripture. There are not other records that even existed on the planet outside of the Roman, outside of the scriptures, the Christian and Jewish scriptures. Okay? And Romans kept very accurate uh, uh, journals of what happened in history. And, and the Greeks did too. There's no mention of Jesus of Nazareth there, only in the scriptures. And a few other places every once in a while. Some of the writings of Josephus or whatever. Um, these two facts can help paint a picture of Jesus and Nazareth that may be more historically accurate than the one painted by the Gospels because that's a totally different image of Jesus indeed the Jesus that emerges from this historical exercise a zealous revolutionary swept up as all Jews of the era were in the religious and political turmoil of the first century Palestine bears little resemblance to the, the image of the gentle shepherd cultivated by the Christian community the early Christian community made him a pacifist. One place he did say, take up your swords. If you have a sword, get one. Get ready to fight. Peter had a sword the night that Jesus was, was uh, 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 arrested, and he cut Malchus's ear off. You remember that? He wouldn't have had that sword unless Jesus told him to get it. Jesus told him to get it. Told all of his disciples to get ready for battle. In fact, they never thought he was going to be king of the Jews, uh, king of um, uh, have, a, have, a, have a heavenly kingdom they thought he would be king of Jews they would topple the Roman Empire since he was the descendant of David son of man set up an earthly kingdom where the Jews then would be would rule uh, Palestine that was what they had in mind even Judas was shocked and disappointed when he, had, when he betrayed Jesus and uh, Jesus let them arrest him and kill him he didn't expect that in fact he apologized and threw the, these uh, 30 um, coins of silver away and went out and hung himself he was so devastated that the, the natural kingdom of Israel was not going to rise up out of ashes he couldn't believe Jesus would be killed the resurrection never crossed his mind he was dead by then. So these are things that you don't hear from pulpits. People don't t tell you about this. So we have this whole idea of Jesus as God that should be worshipped. He should not be worshipped. He never asked or expected to be worshipped. Worshipped. He pointed people to God in them as them, expressing itself in the universe. Of course, at that time, 2,000 years ago, people looked up for God, expecting him to be in heaven. Heaven is a metaphor, and uh, metaphysically, is for higher consciousness. The farthest reaches and rhythms and, and uh, regions of consciousness we would call heaven. And we would believe that some intelligent, uh, ageless, spaceless, endless, innocent being that some like to call God would exist there. But a lot of this is ferratilic or it's fairy tales and it's superstitions and it's images that don't make a lot of sense. But we create something around it because we are we're God-centered people. We want to believe and all of history has believed in something or someone or, or, or some reason for being here. Some higher source or force to whom they could look. And uh, we st we're, we're still like that. So uh, crucifixion was a punishment that Rome reserved almost exclusively for the crime of sedition. The plaque the Romans placed above Jesus' head as he writhed in pain said, King of the Jews, which was a no-no. It was called a titulus, and despite common perception, it was not meant to be sarcastic. The Jews actually protested those words being applied to Jesus on the cross. The Sanhedrin didn't like it when they put king of the Jews. Every criminal who hung on a cross received a plaque declaring the specific crime for which he was being executed. I'm quoting out of the book that Aslan wrote. Jesus' crime in the eyes of Rome was striving for kingly rule, treason. The same crime for which nearly every other messianic expirant of the time was killed. Anybody who considered themselves a messiah or was called messiah or messianic was killed by the Romans, not the Jews, by the Romans, because it was sedition, it was treason. They were traitors. So Jesus didn't die alone. He had two malefactors on either side of him, plus there were other aspiring 
Messiah-like people who had been killed. The Gospels claim that on either side of Jesus hung men who in Greek are called Lestai. A word often uh, rendered, I think that's the way you pronounce it, uh, rendered in English as thieves, but which actually means bandits and was the most common Roman designation for an insurrectionist or rebel. They were bandits. They were insurrectionists. They were rebels against the government, not against Judaism. See? So that image alone should cast doubt upon the gospel's portrayal of Jesus as a man of unconditional peace, almost wholly insulated from uh, the political upheavals of his time, because Jesus was a revolutionist. He himself didn't engage in combat, but he had people that were ready to fight, and in fact did fight. Again, Peter cut that air off. But he had instructed them to get a sword, to get a knife, to get protection. They understood that to mean he was going to start an insurrection top of the Roman Empire, as I alluded to earlier. They were totally confused when he got killed, crucified, and then buried. They were blown away. And then they couldn't find his body, supposedly, according to the scripture, because of the resurrection. They didn't even understand the resurrection. These were just peasants, poor people, or blue-collar workers. They were not highly intellectual academicians and scholars or super pious religious folk. They were just little simple, his disciples, just little simple people. And Luke wasn't one of the disciples. Okay, Neither was Mark. And that's the oldest manuscript, oldest gospel we have is one written by Mark, who wasn't one of the twelve. Okay, Matthew and John were. Luke wasn't and Mark wasn't. The most reliable script, uh, manuscripts that we have are the oldest ones. We have none of the original manuscripts of the Bible. All we have are copies of copies of copies of copies. So the ones that are most reliable are the oldest manuscripts we can find because they've been less dealt with. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't even mean they're authentic. It's just the oldest ones we have. Any scholar will tell you that. Most preachers on Sunday who have been to school don't know that. They don't think about that. They don't, they don't want to hear anything about that. The notion that the leader of a popular messianic movement calling for the, uh, the imposition of the kingdom of God, a term that would have been understood by Jew and Gentile alike as implying revolt against Rome, could have remained uninvolved in the revolutionary fervor that had gripped nearly every Jew in Judea is simply ridiculous. He, he was involved. Jesus was involved in the movement, in the revolution. He used terms like the kingdom of God. He did say, my kingdom is not of this world. His followers didn't understand altogether. But he was like an, an activist, a sacred activist. He hated the way, the way the culture was treating the poor. He despised the way the church, or the Jewish church, uh, Israel was being treated. And he despised, despised even more the way the Papa Sanhedrin legalist treated the little simple people who couldn't even read why would the gospel writers go to such lengths to temper the revolutionary nature of Jesus' message and movement? Why? What are they thinking? Because they wanted to create this messianic personality that people would worship and follow and that they could control. That was part of Constantine's objective, is to control the masses by controlling their God, creating a God that he could control. I know that sounds weird and it sounds anti-scripture, but um, that's that's... That's the reality of what happened. You should read the book before you get overly upset. Read this book that I alluded to, and you can go to Amazon.com. I'm still reading it. It's pretty fascinating. The man, again, I'm really impressed that he was converted to Christianity and became an evangelist, a soul winner. But he was so interested in what he was teaching and reading and studying until he studied it in exhaustive studies, and he started having questions, as I did after 50 years of ministry. Back to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.20. Jesus says this, because this is an important line that I want to close tonight's program. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will, know, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. Now, let me read it again. Jesus says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, how can you be more righteous than a Pharisee? Here's, here's what that means. Except your righteousness surpasses religious and ritual legalism of the Pharisees, you will not recognize, identify, enter, or entertain the kingdom of heaven or higher consciousness. He's not saying you won't go to heaven. He's saying you won't experience elevated awareness unless you get past Pharisaic ritualistic righteousness, which is carnal 
ego is often testosterone driven human logic until you get past that you're never going to really experience the kingdom of heaven you won't experience the glory of God you won't experience a true anointing of Holy Spirit on you look what he says about adultery you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery but I say anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart He's saying basically that's all of us. There's a law. He didn't die, identify it as the Ten Commandments, but he's referring to, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago. Not read. It was said to the people, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, if you look on a woman lustfully, you've already done it in your heart. Then he goes on to say, if your right eye causes you to stumble... Gouge it out and throw it away. Now you biblical literalists, literalize that. If your right eye <laughs> offends you, in other words, if your white right eye is wandering looking at ladies, or if you're a woman, he doesn't re- re- referring mostly to men, but if you are sexually aroused by another human being because you looked at them, what do you do? put blinders on your eyes and walk around like this because you're going to look and like you're going to admire and you might even desire if you're normal even if you're married you're going to feel attraction you can watch somebody on television you can go to sports uh, events you can see uh, ballet dancers or gymnasts or there's you can go to the gym and look at other bodies even other bodies of your same gender that are attractive and muscular or 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 or, uh trimmed and fitted like a woman's with a little waist and, you know, voluptuous bodies and boobs and all that stuff. That's normal. Jesus is saying you are going to look and more than likely you're going to lust. So that rule, and unless you can surpass that kind of legalistic approach to righteousness, you're never going to understand the beauty of all that's around you. Male, female, trees, flowers, buildings, horses or cars in, in our day. There is a spirituality and a human spirituality and a kind of a secular spirituality beyond religion. What's wrong with laying uh, by the lake or a beach or a fountain or a park or going up in the mountains on a Sunday instead of going to church? Now, I like the connectedness. I'm not, you know, I pastor church here, a small group of people. I pastored thousands and did it for 35 years. So I understand what that whole thing is. Um... But I like a day of rest. I, I wouldn't mind talking to you on Sundays on, on here, you know, for, a, for an hour and uh, playing a little music and, and then letting you be free and me be free and go to the beach or go to the lake or go to the zoo, go shopping, go to church. You know, it's okay. Whatever you want to do. Um, but Jesus is saying here, If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. That's one of the 11 times of the 12 times hell is mentioned in the scripture that Jesus uses it. He uses it 11 of the 12 times. He's metaphorically speaking of of, of the the, the rubbish heap around the corner. If you're going to be this hard on yourself, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away, It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. Hebrews didn't even believe in hell. They believed in Sheol. The word hell doesn't appear in their Bibles. The word Gehenna does. And Jesus didn't use the word hell. He used the word Gehenna. The valley of Hinnom or the the word Gehe, Gehe, uh, G-E, or G-H-E, Gehenna. G means the gully or valley or gorge, the Valley of Hinnom, which was the town dump in Jerusalem at that time. And for at least 500 years before that, it had been the town dump, a place of burning and gnawing. It was a metaphor among Jews for waste, for separation, for lack. These were metaphors. And a metaphysical appraisal of them makes you understand them even more. Jesus was not a legalist and he wasn't suggesting that people should be pharisaic. The word means separatist. He was saying exceed that. 
transcend it. Your righteousness has got to be more than legalism and rules and writings and scribblings and scriptures and scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees. About divorce, it's been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. He's quoting the law of Moses. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality or adultery, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. When I can go down a long list of preachers, let alone laity, who have married divorced women. Are they forcing those women to commit adultery? I'm not going to name them, but if I did, some of you know who they are. Others of you will be stunned. Now, you biblical literalist, what you what you going to do with that passage? <laughs> I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for uh, adultery, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, he's talking to Jewish people about Jewish ways of being. That doesn't necessarily apply to other people outside the Jewish culture and customs. Were Jesus alive today, he may have talked totally differently. We've held on to some of these things for so long. Here's what he said, says about oaths, and I'm almost finished. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Well, that's one of them is marriage. But he says, I tell you, verse 34, do not swear on an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. Don't make an oath. Well, what is that going to do with marriage? The oath, the covenant, the sacred words. Don't make it, don't swear on the Holy Bible in, in the court of law. Don't swear by, by earth, for it is a footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair of white grow. In other words, he says, don't swear. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Or, in some translations, it says, just from evil. From something injurious or calamitous or, uh, or destructive. So much I could teach on this. This is, this is the Sermon on the Mount. He hasn't said anything about the resurrection, the cross, the blood. He's saying, you have, he's talking about their scriptures. It was said to the people long ago. Hmm. Eye for an eye. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil. I, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. What? If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. You know you ain't going to do that. <laughs> you haven't done it, and if you have, you weird. You're different. And I salute you. But he doesn't say what to do if you turn it that first time. Maybe the next time you, you turn his cheek or hers, pop, slap him back. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, if somebody slaps me on the right cheek, what if they slap you on the left cheek? He don't say what to do if they slap you on the left cheek. <laughs> you want to be literal about it? Half of these Bible totem fundamentals, if you hit them one time, they will go crazy on your head. If anyone wants to sue you and take, uh, take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. All of us resist suits. We go to court. We spend money. We mortgage houses. People have done that. Christians, if anyone forces you to go one mile, forces us. Ain't nobody going to force. When did the last time you saw somebody testify about being forced to go one mile? Go with them two miles. If anyone forces you, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You do that every day with your children, with friends. You walk by panhandlers all day. Christian fundamentalist literalist, Jewish literalist fundamentalist. Think about all this. Now, these are the words of Jesus, apparently. We don't really know that absolutely, but this is what. Because all the writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, these guys were dead when their books came out. We cannot absolutely verify that these are authentically written gospel 
narratives by the name who is put above whether that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Remember, these guys were not literalist. They, they were not illiterate. They were not literate. They were illiterate, most of them. And so 40 years or so, up to 70 years after Christ, then these books come into circulation. And nobody can verify because we don't have any of the original manuscripts. A lot of it was oral tradition. Who told these stories? Who wrote them down? Were they told or remembered accurately? Were they written down precisely? We don't know. Nobody knows. So there's a lot going on. Love for enemies. Have you heard that it was, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Where did, where did they hear that? Not scripture, just oral tradition and attitude. 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You usually pray on those who persecute you. You don't love your enemies. Most go into these churches, they're mean and angry. Every once in a while you find a little sweet person, but how much will they take? Love your enemies. Very, very few people do that. We don't even think God loves his enemies or its enemies because God reserves help for them. He's going to torture his enemies, supposedly. According to the way most people interpret scripture, God's going to tell you to love your enemies when he hates them, whether that's Hitler or Saddam Hussein or some atheist who doesn't believe. He's going to torture them in hell forever. That's what fundamentalists believe. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and that you may... And that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son, notice, to rise on the evil and the good. There is inclusion. And sins reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. There is some aspects of my inclusion gospel. First, but then he, supposedly that same God that lets the sun rise on them and rain fall on them will ultimately send them to hell. Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Tax collectors were despised by Jews because they were overtaxing them. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even, do not even pagans or publicans, Roman tax collectors, do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Is that possible? Who even knows what, how perfect the Heavenly Father is? Be perfect. The word actually means be precise and be matured. Be a full adult and maximize your potential as a human being. The word is teleos in Greek. Finished. When Jesus said it is finished in Greek, the, the word was tetelestai. Mission accomplished. Finished. Maximized. Fully grown. Ripened. Mature. Complete. Completed. I've reached destination or destiny. So, who is Jesus? You know what's more important? Who are you? Possibly in relationship to Jesus. Because why do you have to compare yourself with a man who lived 2,000 years ago? I love him. I study him. I follow him. But I don't always see myself as just in the light of him as I once did. I'm not trying to be Jesus. I'm really trying to be me trying to find out who that is and get into it more. I want to, to reconsider um, who I am and what it means to be who I am and how that's going to play out, you know, in life. I'm, I find it curious that Jesus referred to scriptures only when he was confronted with his detractors. He, he calls all those scriptures there. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the legalists are there. He really wasn't trying to use them to address the sweet little simple people that were listening to him, waiting for them to give, for him to give them something. Let's rethink what we believe and why we believe it. Again, I've talked a lot about Jesus tonight, and I'm going to finish reading that book, and I hope that you'll do it too. And I, but I want you to see beyond Jesus to who you are and who you can become. Jesus would say, "Follow me, and I'll make you disciples of of men." Not of uh, fishers of uh, men become my pupils. Disciples mean student. So I'm still a student. But of course, knowledge is expanded. But I like the mystical aspect of Jesus. I like Christology, the logic of Christ. But there have been Christ like persons or messianic type per uh, persons long before Jesus. He was one of them, and he was a great one. I don't ex think he expected us to build an entire religion around him and then get the restraints and dogmas and 
doctrines and become so hateful. You ought to study the history of the church. It'll startle you. You almost won't want anybody to know you're a Christian. You, you won't even be one of, I want to be identified with that expression because it's too violent. Yes, I'm tapping. I feel like the universe is telling us to come to the next level, to expand our consciousness. We can do that. Hope to see several of you in October, the 14th through the 16th. Let's talk this more. Okay. Plan to come with me to Jerusalem, 2014. And then finally, support what I'm doing. Give something tonight. I'm taking a risk. My family really pretty much had to, to forfeit a lot because of what I'm teaching. But I can't get away from it. I cannot stop. It's in my spirit. I'm writing talking about their, this movie that they've got called The Heretic. I just found out that Jonathan Demay now is going, who produced Philadelphia and Mancurian Man and um, Silence of the Lambs is directing the movie about my life based on This American Life, NPR. I've got a new book coming out. I think I'm going to title it Transition. Making, Managing, and Mastering Change. There's so much, so much going on. So much. I can tell you a lot more. I'm going to stop right here. I love you. I believe in you. Thank you for your consciousness. Thank you for listening tonight and for sharing these few moments. You can go into the archives and listen to the other lectures that you're interested in. They may not all interest you. But if they do, pick it up, okay? This Sunday, for those of you in the Chicagoland area, I'm going to be at the Bodhi Temple up north. They spell it B-O-D-H-I. It's the Bodhi Center, spiritual for spiritual living um, it's on my site and you can read more about it join me there I'll be at the 9 and the 11 o'clock service we won't have our normal 2 o'clock service this Sunday but we will next Sunday uh, those of you who are watching me live alright God bless you I gotta go thanks you forgive me for going over just a minute but thanks for your time and your, your attention and for your love and again thanks for the gift that you will send today just go take your bank card go right now put something in there 10, 20, 15, 100 whatever we need your support. I really need your help. One of our cameras were recently uh, robbed. Uh, we lost. Somebody robbed my son. He took the camera. And uh, that helps. So we want to expand so many things here. He's fine. And um, he's already bought new lenses. And he's going on. And we're going to go on. But things happen. Shift happens. <laughs> All right. We need your help and support. We love you. We believe in you. And we're here for you. Good night now. See you again next time. Peace. Namaste.